I want to thank you all for being here at the New America Foundation. Welcome you to this event on the Next Generation University. I'm Jamie Marisotis. I'm president of the Lumina Foundation, and I want to welcome all of you for being here. I want to say a special uh, word of thanks to those of you who are here who have participated in the work uh, that's uh, going to be the focus of the discussion today. And I want to take a moment as the President of the Lumina Foundation to say a special thank you to New America Foundation, not only for the great work that's being undertaken as a part of, of this, uh, uh, this project, this effort, uh, but indeed for the broader work that it's doing to help advance new ideas and providing thought leadership around um, higher education and increasing student attainment uh, nationally. Um, this work, I think, is a very important part of what is clearly becoming a national agenda around system-level change for higher education, creating much greater opportunities for larger numbers of students, particularly low-income, first-generation, and, and other underserved populations uh, that are critical to the future economic, social, and cultural well-being of our country. Uh, Lumina Foundation has been in the middle of many of these conversations. Many of you know we're the nation's largest private foundation focused on higher education, and we're particularly interested uh, in the issues around creating greater momentum around system-level change that will create greater opportunity for our country economically, uh, socially, and culturally. Talent is really going to be the driver of our nation going forward and the talent that we develop at the post-secondary level in our higher education institutions is going to be critical to that uh, success of our talent development strategies as a nation going forward. As important as the uh, economic outcomes of higher education are, we need to equally focus on the outcomes that have to do with equity and the opportunities that equity presents uh, in terms of addressing the challenges that we face uh, as a nation. The work to serve, better serve those low-income first generation minority and other uh, populations that are historically underrepresented is going to be critical to achieving higher education goals, goals like Lumina Foundation's uh, goal to increase the proportion of Americans with high quality degrees, certificates, and other credentials to, to 60 percent. The achievement of those kinds of goals is going to require thoughtful strategic collaboration among many different stakeholders, families and students, policymakers, communities, accreditors, employers, and many more. But perhaps no stakeholder is as important as the institutions of higher education themselves, because they are really the delivery agents of the degrees and credentials that certify that talent that's so critical to our future as a country. Um, I think many of us are aware of the enormous challenges that are facing higher education institutions today, challenges that deal with resource limitations, challenges that deal with an uncertain policy environment, and challenges that deal with the vast discrepancies in the pre preparedness of students. When you couple those challenges with the ever-increasing demand for high-quality degrees uh, as the recognition of that societal demand for talent, I think it's clear that the pressure on institutions to be more effective, to be more productive, and to achieve better outcomes has never been higher. And yet what we're here to talk about today is that there are some institutions across the country that have actually risen to that challenge. These institutions have met it head on and are delivering high quality degrees to more students while increasing access and inclusiveness and also while decreasing costs. The admirable examples of these institutions in the critical public research university sector is what we're here to talk about today. Uh, we have um, uh, some of these exemplars that we're fortunate enough to be joined by here for this conversation today as part of this Next Generation Universities Initiatives. Arizona State University, Georgia State University, the University at Buffalo, University of California, Riverside, University of Central Florida, and the University of Texas at Arlington are featured in this report that you'll hear a little bit more about later on in today's programs. Each of these institutions and others that you'll, you'll hear about today has made a commitment to putting the needs of students first. They have a strong interest in both knowledge transmission and knowledge development, with faculty producing uh, significant national, uh, national research while also following a purposeful approach to providing quality education to those large, diverse populations of students. 
These institutions have largely rejected the ivory tower persona. They are student-centered, they are service-driven, and they are pillars in their communities, economic engines embedded in service not only to those communities, but to the regions, to the states, and ultimately to the nation uh, in which they are located. There's much to learn from this next generation set of universities. Uh, our partners at New America Foundation have taken a, a closer look at the vision, the approaches, and the strategies that these institutions have embraced and the, and the operating models that, that they've developed. I want to say a thank you to uh, Jeff Salingo, to Kevin Carey, to Hillary Pennington, to Rachel Fishman, and to Iris Palmer uh, for the work that they've done in the report that we're going to be hearing about today, uh, later today. The deeper dive that they've done, I think, uncovers key factors that have led to these uh, institutions successfully serving more students better while still excelling in that important task of knowledge development through high quality research. So today I'm looking forward to learning more uh, from these discussions about these very important issues. The future of public higher education, uh, increasing retention and attainment, the vital role of research, and the value of harnessing faculty input and expertise to better serve students, all through that lens of what's in the best interest of students. On behalf of Lumina Foundation, we're very proud to uh, support this work. It's our hope that the best practices elevated through this report serve as a sort of blueprint for institutions to better serve the needs of their students, of their communities, and ultimately the nation at large. With that, let me turn it over to Ron Brownstein, Editorial Director of the National Journal, who will kick us off for our first panel. Ron? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us. Um, we have a terrific panel here to discuss the issues raised uh, in this report, which really goes to the center uh, of America's vision of itself as a land of opportunity and whether we still, in fact, can provide opportunity for people uh, to make the most of their talents. To discuss the, uh, these challenges and where uh, higher education fits into, us, we fits into it, we have Mark Becker, the president of Georgia State University, Jane uh, Close Connolly, who is the interim chancellor of the University of California at Riverside, Michael Crow, president of Arizona State University, and John Hitt, president of the University of Central Florida. So the report talks about several traits that uh, you uh, kind of uh, bind together your institutions. But at the core of it is a question of size. You know, in many of our minds, the kind of the ideal of the university remains kind of a cozy, leafy quad and small classrooms of, of, uh, of uh, students with a, uh, with, a, with a professor, maybe with kind of a salt and pepper beard. Um, uh, but all of you have thrived by growing big. Uh, and I want maybe each of you to talk for a minute about what has worked for you in scale and size. Uh, let me start with you. Sure. I think to start off with, uh, you have to start with the right attitude. Okay. And in order for the work that's been reflected in the report to happen, you have, uh, in my mind, you have to start with an attitude that the students you have are expected to graduate. And I want to put that in the context for those of us in the baby boom generation. Most of us have memories of being told, look to your left, look to your right, in four years one of you won't be here. And I see lots of heads nodding because I'm not the only one that had that experience. Uh, the reality was for an institution like mine, uh, back in the days when I heard that, it was look to your left, look to your right, and in four years one of you is going to graduate. The mindset needs to be that in whether it's going to be four years, five years, or six years, because that's one of the first things that um, we face is the majority of our students are working uh, more than 20 hours a week, so it's not going to be necessarily four years. So it's not only the leafy quad, it may not also be um, going straight through classes um, in a lockstep 15 credits a semester to graduation. So once you get your head around that the world is not that ideal that you were um, perhaps brought up to believe was the ideal, uh, you then start saying, okay, got all these students, they're not going to all look the same, they're not all going to have the same experience, but we expect them all to graduate, literally every single one of them. If we do our job right, they will all graduate. Most of them with us, perhaps a few will transfer elsewhere. Um, and then the ma main thing you have to do, um, and it was, it's really revolutionary, is find out why they're not graduating. You know, so um, Dr. Tim Rennick, who's here in the audience and leads these efforts for Georgia State University, the beginning of the innovations was to find out why are thousands of students not graduating? And the answer was you just ask them and they'll tell you. 
And nine times out of 10, or maybe not nine, maybe eight, uh, it was more financial in man managing the financial complexity of navigating the higher education system. And those sorts of issues you can deal with at scale. You can develop the systems and put the people in place uh, to work at scale, whether it's going to be academic matters or financial matters. So it's, um, I would say you start with the right mindset, you ask the right questions. What you need to do after that actually becomes pretty obvious. Chancellor Powell. I think, um, yeah, I completely agree. Uh, in addition, I think we've had to look, as we've grown 150% since the 1990s, we've had to look at what made us special to begin with. How do we build on that and keep offering now students who are coming from first generation homes, many who did not speak English as they entered um, their K-12 uh, work, and, and certainly commit to those students, but then commit, commit to how we have to change to involve them in undergraduate research. Commit to how we have to change to use their experiences to inform our research and our writing. So I think um, as we've come more and more to scale and we're continuing to grow, uh, it's been an interactive process of learning who are they, what do they come with, how can that be part of the learning experience, how do we change because of that, and how do we stay focused on their graduation rates, but also on having opportunities that have traditionally characterized the University of California. You will work as an undergraduate in a lab. You will work as an undergraduate with the English professor and write a paper. That's the kind of um, precious element that um, you know, we'll talk about later about more st uh, specific strategies. But there's all sorts of strategies, technology, use of other staffing that make that possible. But it, ha it does start with saying, th these are the ones who came. There are students who are land-grant university. Uh, we're committed to educating California, whoever California is, and they may not come in, they all come in in the top 12.5%, but they come from very different high schools, but they will leave as elite students, and we're committed to that. President Crump? If you look at the time frame in American history between 1950 and 2050, it's probable that the population of the United States will triple during that time frame from 150 million to something just slightly less than 450 million. We stopped building, with some exceptions, including uh, Riverside and others, we stopped building colleges and universities before 1950. We stopped building them. There's a few that have eked out. There's some that have moved along. And just at the same time as we realize that the infrastructure that we had in the past is inadequate to the level of educational attainment we need to take the whole population to, we've decided to sort of keep this quaint notion that the salt and pepper bearded professor uh, sitting in a classroom on an Ivy quad in Brunswick, Maine at Bowdoin College where I used to be a, a, a trustee, that that's the model that, that we need to have to be successful. I would say that's one of the models that we need to have and a few people will have access to that but that's not a scalable model, it's not a replicable model and so what one needs to think of and conceptualize is for this new America, this unbelievably fast growing, burgeoning, diverse complex, economically uh, challenged be through, through competition country, how do we emerge a new class of institution, a new kind of enterprise in which size is not the enemy, size is the uh, asset. Mm -hmm. And so in our particular case, what we've tried to do is to think about how we could construct hundreds of learning communities tied together across a university framework uh, and, and, and have a frame where you have the benefits of of the of the face-to-face -face interaction with faculty members and the notion of discovery and research engagement which then takes the the learning person to the highest level of cre creativity while at the same time gaining some advantage through size uh, some efficiencies through size and uh, lots of academics uh, my old colleagues at Columbia University would you know jump back in chagrin uh, thinking about efficiency through size but if we don't do it that way there's no mechanism to find a way to educate to the level that we need to educate folks uh, uh, efficiently or effectively. We literally, I've run the numbers back to the envelope, we can't afford $40,000 per year per student as the cost of a university grade education. The society can't contribute that much and so it has to be something dramatically less than that and size and efficiency and innovation are ways for us to be able to do that. And then as a result, when we get to 450 million people, we'll have an increased chance of being more competitive then than we are now. 
President, Hitt, very few institutions have grown as much in the last 20 years as yours. What are the advantages that has brought you? What are the challenges? Well, there, we've, we've grown from about 20,000 to about 60,000 students in, uh, since uh, I got there in, in 92. Uh, we're a very different institution, not just quantitatively, but qualitatively. If you just think of some, some simple things, for all of us academics in the room, if you've got bigger departments, you can have more and better specialization. Uh, there are services that are shared between units that you, one can create uh, if the scale is large enough so that you better serve your creative faculty members, your students, uh, and, and your staff. Uh, there are just many advantages we see. There are economies, as, as Michael was saying. Uh, I, I think it helps us relate to the place we're in. I think place matters. We want to be of as well as in Central Florida. Uh, we want to uh, serve a lot of the functions that uh, you know the land grant university served in terms of providing uh, the expertise, uh, the services that uh, the area of service uh, requires. In the case of the land grants, it was an entire state, and that was a long time ago, and that model seemed to work pretty well. For I think these modern large-scale universities, more often than not, they are not land grant universities, uh, and so they're serving all of the state or a region of the state but they've got the same mentality of providing what's needed. It, it's kind of ironic. If we think about it, the, the, the land grant, the, the great contributions America's made to higher education would be, I think, the land grant, the GI Bill, and the community college. All three have been democratizing and opening up opportunity for new groups of people. Uh, the Morrill Act says it uh, provide education for the industrial classes. That was kind of an interesting choice of words for the 1860s. Uh, but uh, think about the arguments that were made against the GI Bill. Can't handle that kind of growth. Its quality will suffer. Uh, same kind of arguments around community and state colleges, I think. But, it, you know, we really need to, to take a careful look, as Michael has said, how are we going to meet the needs of this century uh, with the models we have? So let's dive in a little further <coughs> where, uh, President Crow, you talked about uh, the opportunities for efficiency and innovation created by scale. I want each of you maybe to talk a little bit about what, uh, a little more specifically about what some of those opportunities have been. Uh, at Georgia State, uh, the report talks a lot about the way you use data on the large scale population to help guide your interventions. Maybe you could start us off by talking a little bit about that. Certainly, well, yeah, you, you know, the big buzz phrase in all the business literature today is big data. Well, big data is coming to universities. You know, We look as we've gone through the technological revolution, how it's changed industries. Uh, travel industry, you don't use travel agents the way you used to if you use them at all. Well, now what's happening in universities, we have a mountains and mountains of data. And there's a lot of information about our students in those data and a lot of information about who's not succeeding and why. And so we mine those data and then we have focused interventions. So what you'll see in our plans where we've been able to move the graduation rates up significantly over short periods of time and not one intervention, it's a series of them because using the data uh, doing some focused um, interviews with students, doing pilot studies, that's the other element. Once we look at the data, uh, like good researchers, we don't assume we know the answer, we have an idea. We generally do pilot studies, and if the experiment works, then we scale it. If it doesn't work, we put it on the shelf and move to the next one. So uh, we've done this around advising, we've done this around courses that have um, high failure and withdrawal rates, we've done it around um, how we've manage financial aid and work with students on financial aid. So it's a very rich environment. And again, this is where scale's an advantage. This is, scale's a big advantage in an environment where you have a lot of data. You know, ask Walmart. What, yeah. <laughs> and I, I'll just, you know, echo that, but from looking at another perspective, our ability to talk to our community, reflecting really what you've uh, shared, and say, we're taking your students we're taking them from San Bernardino, some of the, and from the Coachella Valley, which is one of the lowest income areas in the whole United States. And we're, um, you know, we're connected to you in your economic development. For example, we've changed our Vice Chancellor for Research name to Vice Chancellor for Research and Economic Development, and that we're out there talking to those companies who then employ our students. So it's a, it's a matter of scale, and it's also a matter of targeting, I think, and, and being very committed to, um, the region uh, you know, that we're in. I'd also say we've started to think bigger because we have more students. So we might have once thought, well, what percentage? Would it just be a few percent that would actually be in a learning community? Or what percent might really have um, 
uh, connections with faculty and research. Now we're not satisfied unless it's 60% or 70% because now we realize as we've gotten bigger, we can't have a little tiny you know, um, stripe of kids who have real access. So it's, it's fueled, I think, our mechanisms to reward faculty for bringing undergraduates into their labs or into their uh, theater productions or their poetry writing. Um, and it's also um, opened our, um, I think, our energies toward our K-12 system. So we do a lot, because we have lots of students, we do an enormous around, uh, uh, amount around service learning, um, connections with AmeriCorps, for example, other agencies like that, where we have a mass of students who can make a difference in a local community. And that's an enormous support for us and for what we feel our next steps have to be for growth. So what are some of the specific innovations or efficiencies that uh, size has granted you or made possible? Right, so for us, uh, the reason that size <coughs> is even the topic of the conversation is that the, the structure in which we inherit, which is both partly cultural uh, and sociological as a university, that a class should be this size, a semester should be this length, a class should be 50 minutes, all those things, uh, we, we got used to asking the question, well, why is the semester 15 weeks? No one knew the answer. Uh, you know, why do we have summer sessions? No one knew the answer other than there used to be farmers uh, that would uh, be going to all the colleges that had to go back to work in their, <coughs> their fields. And so what we decided as sort of our approach was to make innovation trump tradition, allow innovation to be the thing that's driving us forward. And then once you begin to grasp the concept of what innovation allows you, then size is no longer a given. So size is a given when you take a series of sacred cows and you try to protect them. The semester will be this, the class will be this, the size of the class will be this. What we've done, in a sense, is, is, is tried to focus on uh, those innovations which lead us to be able to measure, as Mark has suggested, the outcomes of our students and those innovations that allow us to enhance the outcomes of our students, the learning outcomes as measured, the achievement potential as measured, then those become our focus. And so what we've done is probably, the, I think the, the single most significant one for us has been the elimination of the time constraint. So we're no longer operating under a mode that we think that all things should be guided by some universal uh, semi-religious clock called a semester. Uh, that then means then you can have classes of various sizes. You can have classes of various lengths of time. You can have people involved in various and different kinds of ways. Well, when you do that, then the model which is constrained from a size perspective is freed. So we have freed ourselves from that model by focusing on the outcome of our students as opposed to protecting the model and somehow believing that the model <coughs> is in and of itself the path. So President, let me, let me uh, ask you, uh, one of the other threads that bind together all these institutions is a vision of inclusion. I mean, you have a quote in there in the report where you say we define ourselves not by who we exclude, but by who we include. And I think that is a kind of a common And we've added view. four words to that, and how they succeed. And how they succeed. Yeah, right, right. Um, but inevitably, that means all of you are dealing with a lot of first generation students who have no uh, previous college experience in their, uh, in their families. The, the national statistics are pretty daunting on their success rates. Talk about what, it, what you have learned about what it takes to get first generation students, not only in the door, but through the system and out with a, with a, a degree. I think you have to understand that their, their needs and their knowledge base are really different. Um, you know, I was a first generation student myself, so I have a little bit of insight into that. You know, I, I, I went off to college not really understanding what the college experience would be. I, I say only partly in jest that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm by original training a psychologist, that when I went to college, I don't think I could spell psychology. Uh, but I ended up as one, and I, I, I think... Uh, Was it necessary to be able to spell it? Uh, no, no, I don't think so. Uh, in, in my era, you know, I graduated in 62, and that was, things were kind of breaking loose. Maybe you didn't have to spell. <laughs> yeah. um, but, uh, you know, if you, if you think about it, we assume a lot of our students. And uh, often we assume that things we mention, they will really understand or, in, you know, incorporate initially. You, we just have to understand uh, that each group of students, whether it's first generation or members of underrepresented groups, bring their own needs to us. And, and we can't treat them like a monolith. So we've gone to things like a uh, 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 peer-to-peer counseling system for 
first generation students and for out of state students for that matter. For that matter. A lot of individual uh, programs that are designed to uh, guide students into productive paths, help them make the adjustment to the university. If you're large enough, you can support those rather well. Hmm. A very small institution, I think, would have a harder time. Now, maybe they could give a little more individual attention in some areas, but designing programs that work and having the data, being, being able to do organized experiments on what works and what doesn't, it's a little harder if you're down at the, at the smaller scale. Chancellor Connolly, the report says half of your student body, up to half of your student body are first generation students. How do you deal with that? 60%. 60%, 60% wow. 60% are first generation students. That's a pretty incredible so, number. Yeah. It is, um, and of course on, on the positive side, we were talking about scale before, this has made UC Riverside a destination for mm -hmm. first generation students because there's a sense they'll find a home there, they'll find uh, a level of inclusiveness and uh, commitment to their success. I think we have done, I think a, a major issue or a major um, innovation among the faculty has been the learning community that was mentioned early a vast network of learning communities that really mm -hmm. pull students together. Uh, and this peer-to-peer -peer, um, mentoring, because there's nothing like another student who's just a year ahead of you. Is that what it is? In the peer-to-peer, -peer, it's one or two years ahead? One or two years ahead. Mm -hmm. And there's, in, in every one of our disciplinary areas, there are students who, uh, uh, who are trained in that way, who get kind of special badges uh, to do that. We've also uh, about to launch a major um, new effort in uh, a student information system that is a highly interactive student information system. So students can log on, they can follow their own degree progress, they can send notes to an advisor, they can, so trying to build on um, their skills in, in, in following their, the, their own paths, but also giving them uh, tools to do that. Present. So, so for us, uh, uh, part of the key to success for the first generation students is breaking down the replication of the nasty social hierarchy of higher education. Mm. So when I uh, arrived to ASU, we were on the same path as many other large publics where we had a main campus and branch campuses, and people were allocated to those campuses based on some perception of their ability at age 17. Uh, that then discouraged the faculty on the branch campuses to think that somehow they were second tier or third tier. It falsely empowered the students and the faculty on the main campus somehow into thinking that somehow they were better. Uh, and you see this model replicated everywhere. Mm -hmm. So we decided to tear that down, to basically operate under the assumption that each of our 17 or 18 colleges would build its own intellectual identity, its own pedagogical approach, its own student-centric way of doing things, empowering every kid that went to every school so that, for instance, we have two engineering schools. One is called the College of Technology and Innovation and one is our, our engineering schools themselves. They have different methodologies for teaching. One does not feel or act superior to the other. So it turns out that for a first generation kid, if you come in thinking that you've been granted access to something that has no status, then you will be discouraged <coughs> from success. If you are with a faculty that believe that they're in a social hierarchy, somewhere uh, right above a whales in the ocean, you know, meaning there, 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 there's uh, this social hierarchy. So what we have is a higher education system for which social hierarchy and social status is defeating our actual purpose. Yeah. So we had to weed that out of our own institution, which then has allowed us to be more successful in how we engage these students. How do you try to deal with it? Well, actually, I'm going to go back to the peer-to-peer -peer piece. We have the learning communities, which get them in the communities, so they have a support network very early. But we look at peer-to-peer. -peer, we're actually doing something a little bit different, uh, where we're using peer-to-peer -peer in the large enrollment classes, where a significant percentage of the students get Ds, Fs, or withdrawal. Mm -hmm. right. And what we've done is we've trained up a cadre of peers to mentor the students who are struggling. And the professors have going through a different mindset of how they teach. They give assessments earlier, so they identify who's starting to fall behind at the beginning of the semester, right, rather than waiting to the middle in a traditional um, midterm final model. Uh, but what we're finding are the benefits are multi-layered, because first off, the first generation student may not be inclined to go see the professor for help. They, that may not be their mindset of where they come from, and that's how they do it. But if a junior or a senior reaches out and says, I understand that, um, you could use some help, and I did well in that course, and I want to work with you, 
that we've A, found the retention rates or the success rates have gone up dramatically in those classes. But then there's the second layer, which is the student doing the mentoring gets multiple benefits. The first of which is we actually pay them. So go back to the fact that the majority of our students are working to go to school. If we can pay them to actually get an academic benefit as opposed to waiting tables, stocking shelves, or whatever, that's a big win. On top of that, anybody who's ever taught anything knows that you learn it a lot better when you teach it than when you take it. So what we're doing is we're reinforcing the material for the peers so that their likelihood of success, whether it's at graduate school or the job, has gone up dramatically as well. They've worked on their communication skills by the fact that they're teaching somebody else, they're learning the material more deeply, and they're getting paid. So we're, we're getting multiple layers of successes, both when they're starting as well as later in their college career when some of them actually become the, the mentors instead of the mentees. So I'd, I'd like yeah. to add something yeah, sure. to, to Mark. Like to just, yeah. So one of the things that it's important, so people, so Mark says these, these kids get the D's and F's and, and they don't pass these courses. And so the, the simpletons out there in the world then say, uh, oh, well, they're underprepared. I said, you have no idea what you're talking about. Right. So our average freshman dropout has above a 3.5 grade point from high school and an SAT score of 1,200. They happen to come from families with no income. Right. They happen to come from families that have unbelievable social disruption or they come from cultural experiences that are antithetical to the actual structure of the university itself. And so it turns out that what people are thinking of as lack of preparation, we don't admit anyone that hasn't performed in high school at a level that should produce a research university graduate. We don't admit anyone that can't, in theory, based on how they've done, get through our institution and be successful. Yet we have these very serious retention and graduation mm -hmm. problems. And then we're surrounded by people, and it's just, it's just amazing to me, who say, who say, well, you shouldn't be admitting these kids. They're not, they're not qualified to do university level work. I said, they, have, they, they, they completed all the hard classes, they took everything necessary to be successful, and they're still not successful. So one of the things that we've done is we've gone back and looked at what we think is at least half the causality, which is our own faculty, and, and how we engage with them, and what our expectations are for our faculty. So, I mean, you're raising, <coughs> what you're both raising is, is the usual, uh, you know, the historic concern about large institutions is that kid coming in in a big, lecture hall in freshman year, getting a D or an F who you know, just feels totally overwhelmed, either culturally or academically or kind of socially, and would never dream of going to the professor who's this distant figure. I mean, that is, that is the rap historically against institutions that, that grow large. What are the key strategies to overcoming, I mean, you talked about the peer-to-peer, -peer. maybe others could talk about how you deal with that, that fundamental issue, that concern which I'm sure someone's gonna raise uh, before we get out of here. Well, I, I would add something we do specifically to parents, because unlike other universities where I actually have been, where we've been concerned about the helicopter parent and the parent mm. too involved, in fact, we have many parents who, because of their own background and cultural perspective, would not get involved. They've kind of sent their children mm. off. Uh, so we actually have mounted quite a lot of interaction with parents, regular communications, urging the parent to urge the student to contact um, the faculty member. So it's a, it's a little different aspect. And I've been amazed at how effective, sometimes not the first month or the second month, but the parents report mm. back to me that they, in fact, have gotten the message, they've called the student, they've visited, they've, and, and, that's, and that actually has been a help. President, how, how about? You've got to be proactive. You've got to reach out to the students. If you have uh, advisors who contact these students early on in their, in their freshman year, call them up, ask them how they're doing, even that makes a difference. If you look at supplemental instruction, as Mark mentioned, uh, Jane mentioned, uh, we find that the students who really take supplemental instruction from peers get about a grade higher uh, than, than students who don't for whatever reason. So it, you, you don't do any one thing. There are a lot of interventions that you, that you take. You give a lot of um, uh, advice and counsel, a lot of encouragement, it works. I, I think, though, the big, the big issue here is why are we seeing such big rates of, un, of unsatisfactory yeah. progress? Certainly, a, a grade of D or F doesn't prepare a student to go on in that discipline. Maybe a C does, maybe it doesn't, but we know Ds or Fs really don't. Why are there such high rates of poor performance in a lot of these schools? We need to look inward and, and look inward analytically and, and understand better why these students who, as Michael says, are very well prepared, at least in terms of their credentials, 
Why aren't they getting it? Carol Twig has done some great work uh, through her uh, group on uh, redesigning these courses. The results are very clear. You, we had one instance where we raised the uh, uh, satisfactory grade rate from 46 to 64 percent. That's meaningful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but 64, are we really happy with that? Mm. Uh, you know? <laughs> the concept here is, and, you know, starting off these FWs is academic bankruptcy. Yeah. And everybody knows that once you're in bankruptcy, getting out it's is hard. hard. Uh, and so the, our goal here is to keep students from going into academic bankruptcy. And there are, you know, peer-to-peer -peer is important. Um, Michael mentioned it explicitly and John just touched on it. There are some faculty mindsets that are mm -hmm. wrong and the data will tell you the truth. You know, you've got a professor who has literally been failing half the class semester after semester, year after year. Uh, you got to do something about that. That's a, that's a, that's that's a, a failed failing professor. professor. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, 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 that, and, that, and this is a specific real yeah. individual who no longer works at our institution. Yes. <laughs> we, have, we have some okay. of those also. You know, yeah. uh, Please so send names. That's I another piece. Yeah. But, but yet another piece of this uh, that we just put in place this year, which is going to get better with, as we develop the better technology, because right now it's human-based, uh, we still have semesters. We haven't completely abolished them. And we still have something called spring break. So going into spring break, our academic advisors sent out to again, the selected group of classes where things are difficult, the list of students, and please identify who in your class is not, is not on track to successfully complete this semester. And those lists, when they came back to the advisors, not all faculty returned them, but many did, the advisors then contacted the students and said, spring break's coming up. That's a week for you to basically do something about the fact that right now you are not on track to pass this course. And we had hundreds of students came in on spring break, met with advisors about how the, what they needed to do to get their act together because this is not a spoon feeding. The student has a role and responsibility in this educational system. You know, it's not literally high school, college is just like high school, it's very different. There's a lot you have to learn, there's a lot of transformation that happens for the student and it's whether it's study habits, you know, it's any number of things. But being proactive, and so the big part is whether it's the peer mentoring, whether it's advisors inviting students in, over spring break, it's getting information early on how the students are doing and using that to act on their behalf, to encourage them to opt into the system. Well, so when you have a hand-selected class, like the students I used to teach at Columbia, the class is hand-selected. There's no issues relative to, in general, there's no issues relative to the interaction between the, the faculty member and the students in general because the class has been selected through a series of criteria that make that connection almost natural. When you're running a public university, you're bringing in people who are not hand selected. You're bringing in every individual that meets the admission threshold. Now rather than having a, a, a in a sense, a social complexity index of 10, you have a socially, social complexity index of 1,000. Yeah. Yeah. And so the, the, it's the simplified model that appears to be uh, uh, successful because it's simple. Our model isn't simple, so our approach to it is to find a way to do three things. First, to make the institution student-centric. In the simple models, the institutions are faculty-centric. The institutions exist for the benefit of the faculty and the success of the faculty. The students benefit from that environment, admittedly, but it exists for the faculty. In our institution, we must be student-centric. Our objective is to serve the students. Once you make that as a fundamental change, Lots of things start to happen. And then second, because of our size and because of our complexity, we have to have tools to assist us. So we've spent millions of dollars and years of energy to build tools that are just now available technologically that allow us to know every interactive utterance of a student. And we built a thing called eAdvisor. It's, it's done a fantastic job of assisting each of our students and assisting faculty members. We built another tool called the 360. So we're able to pull up any, child, any student, any kid, and know every single one of their interactions at all levels, social, uh, judicial, uh, uh, extracurricular, academic, every course. And so now we have predictive models and other kinds of things that with the kind of diversity and complexity that we have, it turns out, and this is hard for people to understand, that the traditional elite successful universities and colleges in the United States are not designed for complexity. Mm -hmm. They're designed for simplicity. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're designed to operate in a certain box. That box is not scalable. So you have to create a different kind of series of 
ways to get these things done, and that's what we have focused Let's on. Let's talk about another area of technology. All of you are uh, innovating and experimenting with different forms of online education. Uh, talk a little bit about what you have done, what the reaction has been, what are the opportunities and limits. Maybe, Professor Hitt, starting with you, you you've uh, created a uh, system also to train the faculty. Yes. Uh, and you know, who the report says have been kind of mixed in their initial response to, uh, to the use of these innovations. Talk about how all this is playing into your strategies. Well, the, the, the response of the faculty is mixed, or was mixed, uh, uh, probably still some today, but much less so as people gain experience with uh, uh, distributed or online learning. Uh, we, we set up early on uh, a training program for faculty members who are going to teach online. Uh, and we thought that was really important because if you just say, you know, go teach an online course, the early adopters generally do reasonably well, but then it just, it dies because it's only those technologically sophi uh, sophisticated people, uh, who, many of whom are successful, that can carry it on, and there aren't that many of them. So we, we set up modules where we've got instructional designers, uh, we've got uh, web specialists, you know, we, we have a, a really good induction program, if you will, for faculty members who are going to teach online. We've had over a thousand faculty members complete that course. We pay them to do it. Not a whole lot, but a little extra stipend. Ten bucks. <laughs> <laughs> a little more than that. A Add a couple zeros. <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, you know, it, 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 has, it, it has really made a difference. Uh, we're to the point now where 28 percent of our credit hours are delivered entirely online. Mm. Uh, as a university, and it's growing about 2% a year. A uh, full third of our instruction is done either on, entirely online or in the hybrid or mixed mode courses. Uh, we, we find more and more faculty uh, willing and eager, even eager to do online instruction, and it has helped us manage the resources of the university in some very helpful ways. Just think about being able to aggregate demand so that you're not, for purposes of meeting a small number of students' needs to graduate, offering a course to five or 10 people or 15 people. You can aggregate demand or uh, offer it to a size class that's uh, economically feasible, scalable. How are you using it? So the technological innovation that has shocked us that we're literally on fire around right now is, is this term that we use called adaptive learning, which you could also think of it as individualized learning. Mm -hmm. So through a range of technology partners working closely with our faculty in unbelievable Herculean efforts uh, to uh, de reconceptualize and devise new ways of learning. We found ways to now take the learning in a room like this room where we know every single interactive learning outcome of every person in the room. And our faculty are shocked at now what they know that they didn't know before. So for us, it's been this scaling down in certain courses, particularly the general education courses, through the use of technology, ways in which we get dramatically higher learning outcomes. So for instance, in some of our uh, introductory level math courses, we've gone from a 35% failure rate to a 10% failure rate and lowered our cost by 50% at the same time. But more important than either of those things has been our ability to now know that every student is mastering all of the eight principles that the course yeah. is trying to get across. So they actually understand probability, which then will help them to not fail. So we built these uh, intellectual roadmaps where we know that this course is essential to success in this course, in this course, in this course, in this course, and through this adaptive learning process that we put in and the technology platforms that we've put in, what we now have is a tireless aid working with our faculty members to ensure that every student can stay on track to meet their individual objectives. And five years ago, we didn't have this. Now we have it with tens of thousands of students involved, and it's unbelievable. Yeah, so one of the things that maybe the casual observer doesn't recognize that, that uh, both of you have mentioned is that actually in the best designed online and hybrid type courses, there's much more student interaction. Yes. And it can be monitored and it can be evaluated. And so we've had early uh, examples of, you know, if you have a class of 50, there's usually 10 who talk a lot, right? But on the online version, all 50 can be judged on and prodded to do that. One of the talking uh, to each other about talking the to course. each other the and collaborative program. projects and uh, feedback. You you uh, mentioned earlier the uh, benefits of scale. I'll I'll mention something at our system level. We have nine general campuses, ten altogether. Well, we'll be launching uh, just in the next um, uh, quarter, I think, um, 
uh, UC online situation where students from Riverside, well, faculty from Riverside might have some general education courses that UCLA or Santa Barbara or San Diego might take because they're impacted in those mm -hmm. areas. And same there. And so we intend to have a suite of 100 general education courses. Really for the, the point, we won't be selling them to anybody. We'll be making sure our students never miss a gen ed course so that they fall behind. Uh, and they get the benefit of you know, great stellar faculty like our, at all of our institutions uh, for, for those particular specialties. So we're very excited about that. But these are not you know, put up a videotape and watch them. This is not look at the PowerPoints. These are highly interactive situations that do require person power to make it work. And so the irony to me as we scale up the need uh, is that the need to personalize continues to mm -hmm. rise. So it's not, an, it's not a, a simple, well, we, we have thousands and thousands, literally, in our case, more students. And so they've, w we can kind of segment them into larger groups. No, in fact, now we realize we have to be much more uh, specific in learning about them. And Before, you, so uh, the opposite yeah. of a MOOC. The well, opposite yeah. of a MOOC, yeah. yeah. Well, it's, yeah. Um, I'm not going to disagree with anything. I actually want to hone in on this point um, for where we're going and where the future is. Mm -hmm. And since the MOOC word's been mentioned, there's this sort of fallacy out there that we're not going to need very many professors. Everything's no. going to be prepackaged. No. What the reality is, what we're really trying to figure out right now, and I'm sure this is happening at all our institutions and many more, is what is the machine human interface, if you will. And it's not just how does the person interface with the course, but where is the best use of the faculty member in the education? Right. Okay. So in a previous life, I used to teach introductory statistics for a living. The problem is, is that hundreds of faculty, if not thousands of faculty, many thousands of times per year give the same lecture I used to give. That is a waste of a faculty resource. We should be able to, particularly for our large enrollment courses, concentrate the content, if you will, just the straight knowledge down into some very high quality products that we all use but what happens, what happens that's important is the interaction between the humans that takes place, whether it's in discussions, whether it's in projects, whether it's in simulations, whether it's in internships. And the most power that a professor has in the life of any student is the power to tap, tap a student on the shoulder and say, have you thought about this? Yes. Because almost every time I say that, the majority of the people in the room remember the <coughs> professor that suggested that they either change their major um, consider going into a different sector, going to grad school and becoming a professor. Mm -hmm. The power of the professor, the, the humans are actually central to the future. Mm -hmm. They're not ancillary, but we have to figure out how to use that very precious resource called the faculty member optimally and not waste their time doing repetitive tasks. So is the trajectory, I mean, all, there was this discussion in the report that several of you used kind of high, talk about hybrid right. courses. That, that, mm -hmm. that, is that the trajectory that will become essentially the default? that there will be some online component to virtually all? Uh, so. Or, or yes. you think so? I hope so. For, for everything that's large. But I mean, you have to, you have yeah, to be yeah. disciplined yeah. in how one articulates right. that because yeah. a lot of observers, again, oversimplify. So we've, we've tiered our uh, educational experience into three basic categories. The general education, right. for which we think technology can be a powerful tool in assisting. Right. There's the disciplinary or transdisciplinary education, for which Technology, again, can be useful, but less so because now yep. you're in this deep interaction with the faculty member. And then the third level is that which is related to critical thinking or deep analytical problem solving for which it, it, that's, a, that's a, a completely amorphous, uh, complex overall setting that you've, you've developed. So what, what we're trying to do is we're trying to imagine the emergence of, of the opposite of what some pundits think is that somehow the robots will be teaching people is the, is the development of super faculty. Mm -hmm. Faculty members who are able to work in all three of those spaces, right. Right. but in the, in the general education space, they will be deeply assisted by learning tools and learning assets that allow them to focus their energy on those things that, that help to sort of produce the, the uh, ultimate learning experience. Yeah, the greatest for the value. Yes. Yeah. I want to bring in the audience in a few minutes, but let me, let me try to kind of ask you two sets of, of broader questions. Uh, one is, even with all of this innovation and efficiency, you are essentially swimming against a tide of diminished public support for these public institutions. In most cases, California may be one of the most, most severe. <laughs> Arizona's uh, we, worse. Yeah, and, and, oh, and, and we, are, we, are seeing, we are seeing, in effect, a generational shift from the idea that public 
higher education is a common good that should be supported by kind of the broad public to one in which it is seen more and more in effect as a private good paid for by parents and students themselves. I think the report says we've gone from tuition being a third of your educational cost revenue to now half yes. within a decade. What are the implications of that basic shift from this being something broadly funded by the public to something that is much more centered on the parents and students themselves. So one, one thing, I, I just in that, in that question, I think that's absolutely important to get on the table, that we're at sort of a step function interlude. So it is true that public investment has been going down as a percentage of what people have been investing. It's not true that the public hasn't been investing massive amounts of money into public higher education. They have been. What is the case is that as demand for the, for the good or demand for the service has been going up, there is no means under the existing model to sustain that level of investment. So the, um, as more and more students have been added, the investments are still going up, but the amount per student is going yeah, down. Yeah. And so, and so what, what, what has to happen here is this is what we're here talking about. I mean, you have to think of new models in which public decision makers can be then, then again excited that as we can improve our efficiency and our effectiveness, get more for the investment, which we've been letting some people down in that particular category. So I actually think that we're at an interlude moment where there is a need for this reworking of some aspects of higher education so that new kinds of investments can be made. It, for instance, if people would make investments in us relative to massive infusions of technology, we think that we can operate on a dramatically lower cost, but we have to have infusions of, of dollars to allow us to be able to do that. So there's maybe even new types of investments that can be made to allow us to move in new directions. And so it's not just that they've been going down in resources, it's that the system now is trying to educate so many people. Mm -hmm. well, I think part of, another part of it is I think the question itself needs to be narrowed down. Because what happens when the question that you put for, to us gets out there, people then start looking at all of higher education. Okay, and so the reality is I would gather that the, in, the tuition at each of these institutions, that our students will graduate with debt, and the majority of them graduate with debt, but for our institution, the average debt at graduation is in the sixteen to $18,000 range. That's more than zero, but their starting salaries and the premium that they will get for having that college education will allow them to retire that debt in a manageable way. Where this conversation gets convoluted is when you start bringing in situations where students are taking on massive amounts of debts, yes. hundreds of thousands mm -hmm. of dollars of debt, uh, because they're, uh, particularly if they're jumping around getting a multiplicity of degrees from very high-priced institutions, and then they have a starting salary of 50000 and they owe over 100000 That is a different conversation. That is not the issue we're dealing with. We are dealing with being able to financially help large numbers of students manage what is a difficult situation but through different financial instruments and tools that we have at our availability, whether they're publicly supported, philanthropically supported, and some amount of debt, this is still a great investment with a tremendous return to the individual. Uh, what we have lost is you know, the sense that the public should pay for the majority of it. Uh, it's not a sustainable model, as Michael's already said. What we have to do is navigate the reality we have, which is we still get more money, but it's not as much as we need to be able to do everything. And we, we just have to manage the situation so that the students, when they graduate, have an education that's going to allow them to basically have a quality of life where they can retire whatever debt they took on and make meaningful, meaningful contributions to society and their families. Can you manage your way past the diminished resources? Uh, I think we are managing, but I worry about uh, something you've written about, actually, um, in articles, I think you called the gray and the brown, mm -hmm. that we have a, um, an, an aging population that, in fact, has been pulling back from a notion that uh, they should be involved in supporting the education of the next generation. So I recognize that tension. I feel that tension when I go out and I talk to groups. You know, the University of California was essentially free free for decades and decades. And look at the economy of California, eighth and now ninth largest economy in the world. That California got its, uh, I mean, you can trace the economic development of the state to its higher education universities. And we generally say University of California, but more than that, mm. obviously. Uh, but yet now we have, in almost any group I speak with, they say, these kids want this for free. Well, they had it for free, but somehow that's changed in their minds now. Mm. <laughs> That is not, it's not so good now that 
we had it for free, but they shouldn't have it for free. So although we are managing and we're doing, I think, a fabulous job, and our cost for, per student is actually a bit higher than some of the others, um, at the same time, I, you know, I don't think we can, uh, without other infusions, and I don't expect them from the state, I do expect them from business, uh, corporate partnerships, philanthropy, other kinds of businesses we will get into uh, to support it. But we can't just efficient ourselves into and, and keep a level of excellence that I think we would be satisfied with. Now, I hope I'm wrong about that. And we, we haven't hit that wall yet. But I, I do worry about a kind of societal pullback. Mm -hmm. President Hitt, what's what the role of the public support? Well, I think we've gone too far, in, in, uh, at least on a per-student basis. We've, we've gotten the contribution below where it needs to be. I worry about the very groups that we're most concerned with serving and their ability to afford uh, higher education in the future. If we keep running the tuition up and don't uh, increase the need-based aid that's available at the federal and the state level, uh, I worry that we're going to see an even worse uh, distribution of higher education benefit than we have now if you look at it from the standpoint of uh, parental income. You know, if you've right. got a well-to-do family, what is the, you know, what is it, 60, 80 percent of their, of their yep. uh, uh, sons and daughters will have a, a college degree, a baccalaureate degree, 80 percent. Uh, it's what, 8 percent mm -hmm. from the bottom quartile? It, it's, that's unsupportable. Uh, we've, if we're going to be successful in a knowledge-based world economy, we just can't have that maldistribution of, of educational benefit within our society. But that's why we have to be successful in graduating yes. all the students we take, because right. if we're only graduating a third of them and you're a taxpayer, would you invest in a company that sells cars and only one out of three cars actually works for more than a year? That's what I was trying to yeah. say, is that, is that yeah. it, what happened, I think, was not just the recession, which then led to these reductions. It was that the value proposition yeah. uh, hasn't been updated. And so what we've been working on, and we're not there yet in Arizona, but we've made a lot of progress, is a completely new model. So we have abandoned the old failed model of pay the university for the number of students that they have, which they, mm -hmm. which they occasionally did. Uh, so over, <laughs> over, been a while. Less so, less so. so that didn't work. And so we've said, okay, yeah. if we are supposed to be adding to a uh, high wage jobs and we're supposed to be adding to the economic competitiveness of our region, let's measure that. Yeah. And based on our performance, you will invest in us based on our performance. And we have gotten people to, I don't want to oversimplify it, but we, we're moving in that direction. And mm -hmm. when we move in that direction, we think, and we've already seen this, that investments will start going back up. Well, that, uh, not, it, not from the state, though. From the state. From the state. Yes. Well, okay. that's targeted at you, least. Yeah. You've raised the final area I want to just raise real quickly before we, we go to the audience, which is this question where, where the political conflict seems to be intensifying or coming, the storm seems to be coming, is on this question of completion, especially mm -hmm. against okay. the backdrop of debt, the notion of large number. We, we've, we've expanded access enormously over the last generation, but as you note, the completion gap between kids from, who start from the top of the income ladder and those from the bottom is actually wider now than it was uh, three decades ago. Um, so Particularly when one aggregates in the for-profits. And so one of the things mm -hmm. that doesn't occur is there's no disaggregation of the data at the national level. So we just did the disaggregation yeah. of the data. So Arizona shows up on some one of these Huffington Post's you're screwed lists because you're, you're, <laughs> you're on one of these bad lists. And so it was a, who has the highest default rates? So Arizona is one of the 13 states with the highest but it's default rates. So we then went school by school, university by university, 70% of the debt defaults were from one institution, the University of Phoenix. 70% mm -hmm. in, in one state was from one institution. And so what we have is aggregation of data on a national level, which is not reflective also. of the textures yeah. uh, of the differences. And so one has to disaggregate to but really still, know even what's I going think on. When, you when you do look at public universities, four-year universities by, on their own, I think it's about 60% is the number I've seen for, four, for six year completion rates uh, for students. That's even higher. That's even it's higher. 55. 50, yeah. yeah. And, and for community colleges, it's in the public community colleges, it's in the 30s. That's high. Uh, um, uh, th those are the, the most favorable ones. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're different. There's a range of how you, how you calculate it. So, what, I mean, how serious a challenge is, I mean, is this the core challenge, getting more kids not only in the door but out the door? Uh, and what are what have you learned about what is the most important? You, 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 as we started this conversation, you mentioned the financial challenges, but kind of rank the different issues that you see in improving completion rates and how far can they be improved? Well, first off, they, 
there should be no limit other than 100 percent to being com being able to complete. Now, actually, you know, you said 55 percent, or it's in the 50 percent, but even with our student population, over half of which have Pell Grants, so by definition, fairly low income, if you look at the students who start with us, over 50 percent finish with us. But then if you go to the National Clearinghouse, we're actually getting up to almost three quarters mm -hmm. already. So it shows you can take economically disadvantaged mm -hmm. students and move beyond that 8%. Uh, but I think the single biggest hurdle, but it's not the only one, and that's the key, is the financial issue. And it's being able to manage it. You're bringing students, particularly first generation students, who have not grown up in the main with sophisticated financial management skills, and you're putting them into a very complicated world. You generally need a PhD to complete a FAFSA form, and that's where you go to get your financial aid. Yeah, well, uh, you know, about 60, we, our four-year graduation rate is about 60%, and our six-year graduation rate is closer to 70%. Um, we're not satisfied with that because that's the lowest in our whole UC system, so we're not happy with that. I think that um, the financial stuff is huge among our students. But I, I think it's been, a sh it's got to be a shift. Uh, you know, Michael mentioned it before, and I would expand. Faculty used to think, if I fail half the class, that makes it clear that I have a rigorous class. Yeah. The faculty shift to say, these are really elite students. They are top SAT. They are top in their class. Their GPAs are strong. What is it about the way that I teach that is missing half my class or three quarters of my class. So I think it is these academic um, support. Uh, we do bridge programs, of course, to try to get kids ready before they actually walk in the door. Do the K-12 work to try to get them ready even before before they walk in the door. So I, to me, it's that academic readiness because once they fall behind, you mentioned the bankruptcy. Yep. Yep. They start to fall behind, <clears throat> then they get hopeless. Oh, it's going to take me five years. Oh, now it's going to take me six years. Um, but there's nothing magic about that either. I think. You, you know, we tr we try to talk to our students about you're doing what you're doing now for what reason, and most of them among our students are very aware that they are carrying a banner for their families, the first one in their families ever. They might even they have older brothers and sisters; those kids didn't get get to go to college. Ooh. They're the ones. The hope is on them. So they're very, as a as a rule, I'd say they're very motivated to do that. Well, how do we support that? How do we not discourage them? So I think the academic and uh, our student services. Um, uh, are extremely robust in terms of getting them involved in organizations, getting them committed to service learning projects, keeping them engaged and fulfilling the ideals that they have. So an, an ecosystem of success. Yeah, so, yes. so, so in our case, so we look very carefully at why students drop out and uh, financial reasons are not the dominant factor. The dominant factor in my view is um, the higher education culture which we just heard about relative to the faculty. That is, we have faculty who are either inadequately prepared or do not want to teach across the spectrum of social complexity that we are facing. What they often want is they, so I, I, one of our dilemmas is that let's say, let's say three, let's say 80% of our faculty were 1,500 SAT score people. They went to college for 20 years. They, they, they got full grants to graduate school. They went to the greatest schools in the country. They, they are high academic achievers. Well, that's, that's one, fr you know, the percentage of PhDs in the American population is less than 1%. Percentage of PhDs teaching at our schools is a fraction of that. The people that are successful with tenure are a fraction of that. So you have these elite academics now being asked in these large scale public universities to engage a breadth of learning that is beyond their social their skills or their personal experience to comprehend, and they are failing. So one of the things that we have done is we've, we've just taken the mirror and turned it around on us. Yeah. And we have said, we are the problem. Everybody thinks the students are the problem. We're taking students qualified to do university level work in a research university, and they're failing. Whose fault is it? We have to blame ourselves, re-engineer how we do things, become student-centric. And so we have set our objectives we have a very diverse student body, and so we've, you know, we're, come hell or high water, we're going to perform as well or outperform those institutions which handpick their classes, because that's our mission. Our mission is to take every qualified student, every qualified student, that's our mission. What hasn't happened is that we've never been structured to actually deal with that. 
and, and no one has. So we're facing this for the, in a sense, for the first time in American society. It used to be all the classes were handpicked. Now the public, you know, some public universities are taking, like Riverside, you know, taking a very different student body than they have just a few miles away in Los Angeles right. or a few miles away in Irvine, just within Metro LA. There's three, three big UC campuses and they're very different from each other. It turns out it, you actually have to become a teacher. You actually have to figure out how to teach across a broad spectrum of people. And for whatever reason, most faculty aren't willing to do that. And we've been able to re-engineer our institution where we're starting to. But it's not hit. easy to do. Yeah, last word on completion, then the audience. Well, I, I want to come back around to talk about the advantage of scale as you deal with these issues of completion. We can afford, because of size in our institutions, to put together groups who look at these questions and try to come up with solutions. If we were much smaller, it would be very difficult to pull the required resources out of much smaller budgets, much smaller faculty and staff groups, uh, and really make meaningful progress on this. So I think, uh, you know, once again, uh, I'm, I'm going to say that uh, size matters, scope is an advantage. Uh, and if we're really going to solve these problems, I think it's the larger universities that are in vibrant metropolitan areas that will lead the way. Great. All right. So we have, uh, do we have a microphone? And we do. And we have a hand. So we're going to have the microphone Perfect. and the hand Perfect come together. Good. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah now we can. Okay. Uh, following up on Could what you identify yourself? Uh, uh, sorry, Susan Lehman, Department of Education, Office of Postsecondary Ed. Um, I used to teach at Columbia University when you were there, and so I have a question for all of you. One of the things your institutions do is produce faculty, future faculty. So how have you changed your training of future faculty to embrace your new models, and how have you changed your hiring of new faculty to hire the kind of faculty who would respond to your new models? You know, why not get to like one of our biggest not yet solved problems? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 that's, why, that's why we're all hesitating here. So I'm like, wow, she's like asking this question that's actually really important. So the answer is on faculty hiring, what I can say in our institutional case, we are, we are attracting and hiring faculty members committed to our new vision, this vision of inclusion versus exclusion. And we're working with them and empowering them in different ways. To the production of new faculty members, I don't think we are even 10% down that path right. yet because it turns out that the, the quest of the pursuit of the PhD in whatever the subject is is so overwhelming and so brutal in and of itself uh, and the survival rates are as limited as they are that then to add another dimension to that I, I can say in our case we have not figured that out yet. I think but that's uh, a very good question. It's a very good question. I'd say where I see uh, progress uh, at UC Riverside is that the number of training grants and IGERTs and other where we have our doctoral students and our undergraduates together. Now this might be just by osmosis and maybe I'm being overly hopeful, but we do have many of our graduate students not just as TAs, but in research um, connections with the very students we've been talking about. So at least early, and, and they're all required to TA at least one quarter, the, at least early they're exposed to, there's a vast array of different worldviews and experiences mm -hmm out there and if I'm going to be a teacher I'm going to be facing some of those and I say they that we have the great advantage of having some fabulous National Academy of Science people who are themselves teachers who have committed in addition to being at the top of their game in plant genomics uh, plant biology they have committed to building these labs for genetic you know discovery of plants and so we you know there's P, there's faculty for these PhD students to look up to and, you know, but we need 100 more of them, 500 more of them to make it, to make the scale that you're, you're reflecting, I'm sure. Yeah, I will concur that I don't think we've actually changed how we've prepared faculty for centuries. Okay, it's an apprentice model. It's been an apprentice <coughs> model. It's still an apprentice model. Uh, but there are some things that have changed. And there's also some things that go on at places like ours. So, for example, uh, this uh, attitude about not wanting to teach, we actually encounter less of that. Mm -hmm. Faculty come to Georgia State because of the students we have. Faculty are attracted right. to our university because of what we have. You know, the, my first three months on the job spent a lot of time with uh, campus leaders, including faculty, and they were attracted to the institution because of the diversity. 
it is meaningful to them and their careers to be transforming lives in the way they are. Now, it's not all of them, and it's not that we don't have issues with some individuals, uh, but we actually see that as an advantage. The other important point, and this goes back to my time at Michigan on the faculty, where I actually was responsible for evaluating every single faculty member every single year in my school uh, for annual reviews, is there's a little secret that people actually believe the opposite of, and that is your best researchers tend to be your best faculty. And part of it is, is your best researchers got to be best, not only because they were smart, but they knew how to communicate the importance of what they did. And, they do, and the best of them do that with undergraduates, they do it with freshmen, as well as doing it with PhD students. And what we need to do is actually elevate that, talk about it, and celebrate it much more. Uh, because there's this myth that uh, great researchers are not good teachers, and that's actually not the ex real experience. Anything? Well, a couple of, couple of things. Uh, I forget who said it. It's, uh, you know, the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. And uh, I think a lot of the training and the other issues we raise, you can find exemplars on any of our campuses. But if you, if, you, if, if you ask what are you doing as a broad generality, it gets harder to answer. So we can find really outstanding researchers who are great at working with their apprentices, if you will, and that works out pretty darn well. Uh, if you try to force that model, though, onto everyone all at once, uh, it's going to be very difficult. So I think we, we, we keep working on what I have often thought of as a, a quiet revolution that shifted uh, the emphasis from teaching to student learning. And I think that's been going on at least since the 80s, and it's still in progress. But I think that's a very hopeful thing in American higher education. There was another question over there. Let's see. Carol LaVille, uh, does this, you can hear me? Okay. Carol LaVille with the School of Professional Extended Studies at American University, uh, which is a brand new school, uh, and we are trying to put in place many of the ideas that you are proposing, but at the private university mm -hmm. level, uh, which adds some additional challenges. Following up on the previous question and conversation about faculty, a lot of what I'm hearing you say puts a great burden on the individual faculty member, whether they are trained properly, whether you've hired the right faculty member. The reality knows that the institutional infrastructure that supports faculty has not kept pace. So if you are at the same time not making changes in the way in which we think about tenure and in the way in which we reward and incentivize the faculty beyond whether they are good researchers or scholar teachers. I, I, I am very concerned how we can make this fit and I wonder what you are doing at your individual universities to actually change the structural constraints around faculty incentives to be part of the solution. Thank you. Well, this is the question that's always asked by the professor in the room. It always comes mm. down to faculty incentives. Uh, but it was at the beginning, at least the answer from my perspective and what we're doing was actually at the front end of your question is you have to change the, the infrastructure and the support systems. Uh, we're not fundamentally changing the criteria for promotion and tenure. If anything, we're becoming more stringent because we actually want to put the support systems in place and it's back to my earlier um, comment on how we use technology. So the faculty member spends his or her time where it's of the greatest value, and they spend the minimum amount of time, if any, on things that are repetitive or uh, tasks that are more appropriately sent someplace else. So it's hiring, we've hired professional undergraduate advisors and really made them into professionals, rather than going back to where we started this conversation in this leafy college uh, model where the professor had a small number of students, knew each of them individually, mentored them as undergraduates. That doesn't work at scale. Um, what it does, it ends up in the inconsistent advising. It ends up faculty doing things that actually are not the best use of their time. Uh, we do expect them to be excellent in educa as educators, and it's, it's student learning, it's not just teaching. We also expect them to be excellent in research, and we're not going to back away from that at any right. point in time. If anything, we should recommit to that. But we have to have the infrastructure, the programs, the people, the supports, the technology, so they're not spending their time in ways that is basically wasteful of this incredibly valuable resource, the tenure track faculty member. We heard our faculty ask for help uh, in, uh, in improving uh, teaching. 
And so we worked with our faculty senate to create a faculty center for teaching and learning, which is available to help groups and individual faculty members uh, better their instructional skills. Uh, secondly, uh, uh, there was a great program started in our system, university uh, system in Florida, uh, oh, more than 15 years ago. Uh, and it enabled us to give to faculty members who demonstrated high quality teaching for significant numbers of students uh, a, a, an increase to their base salary of $5,000. And those awards are available every year in big numbers uh, and individual faculty members I think can win or are eligible to win one every five years. We've got faculty members who've won uh, three or more of these now. Uh, some of them are also our best researchers. That's a great idea. No surprise. Uh, and we've also got a similar set of rewards for uh, faculty members, similar program just focused on research and the scholarship of teaching and learning. So we've got a suite of rewards that uh, are suitable and, and I guess that uh, would tip one of my uh, strong concerns is that our rewards really apply to the behaviors we want to see improved. So in, in, in our case, uh, the last 10 years we've seen our faculty that we have now uh, produce twice as many graduates per year from 9,000 to 18,000, quadruple their research activity from 100 million to 400 million a year uh, without a medical school, that's a significant uh, number, uh, to do a, a range of other things all related to their creativity, productivity, and so forth. And while we have not done enough to recognize their achievement because of the great recession that we've just been through, what we have operated on is a model of, we have a fantastic faculty of deeply dedicated individuals who are able to achieve these fantastic things. And so what we've now realized is that, is that we can achieve far more than we ever imagined by allowing the faculty to organize themselves intellectually rather than organizing themselves like every other university, organize themselves the way they'd like to be organized, structure themselves the way they'd like to be structured, empower them to move in these new directions and then support them. And so I said earlier in the comment, this idea that we have now that we're just beginning to emerge of the super faculty member, mm -hmm. the super faculty member who's supported by, by archivists and pedagogical engineers and librarians and other kinds of tools and assets and technologies around them. And when we resolve our financial model to a higher extent, we will take the salaries of these faculty members up mm. dramatically because of their contributions and their level of contributions as knowledge creators and knowledge synthesizers and knowledge integrators. And the enabling mechanism for us to be able to do that is freedom from the standard operating model of all other universities. Uh, we have time for one more question. So let's see if we can squeeze in a, a quick one here in the front. Hold on, wait for the microphone. Hi, Jeff Mervis with Science. There's been a fair amount of trash talk about the elite universities, but yet to the rest of the world, U.S. higher education is the best in the world because Stanford, MIT, Columbia, Michigan, Cal, the publics as well as the privates. Um, do you see them as eventually becoming irrelevant if they don't address the issues that you're talking about, completion, scale, diversity, or are they just going to be on a completely separate plane? Are they able to sustain themselves through philanthropy and other means? And so they'll become really even more of a, sep a second higher education system. You know, the graduation rate, the six-year graduation rate at the University of California, Berkeley is in the 95%. So these are, there's an elite university that is, is at least meeting that uh, goal. I, I don't see them becoming irrelevant. I don't have any uh, big uh, foresight here, but I see that, as mentioned earlier, there's a whole array of universities that this very complicated country needs. And um, so I see them fulfilling a niche as I see us fulfilling a niche. Uh, so I don't feel like there's, you know, the, there's a death knell to the elitism, but there's certainly a death knell to how what, much people can pay. Yeah. What's the niche that you see them filling? Well, for example, the kind of research that can be done with the investment, for example, in astronomy, just as an example, University of California system, that, that could not be replicated in another place, partly because we're in Southern California, partly because, yeah. So that has to be done for us to move forward. So I think that's, that's one of the niches. And why shouldn't kids from every, for example, 
Berkeley, which I don't usually brag about since I'm Riverside, <laughs> but Berkeley has more Pell Grant students at Berkeley than all the Ivy Leagues together. So it's not that uh, there, this is elite in some sense of you know, the ordinary, the industrial kids can't get in. Yeah. But it's elite in having built an infrastructure that allows for the kind of research that actually moves us forward um, in the next century. Yeah, th these institutions aren't going to go away. They're going to continue to thrive. And as you mentioned, they're held up as, you know, American higher education is great. But where American higher education differentiates itself is, A, that we, the number of outstanding institutions per capita is greater than any other nation in the world. But B, when you go to those other countries, after you visit their elite institutions, you fall off a cliff in academic quality. And that's what does not happen here in the United States. We've got literally hundreds of high quality institutions. We, our goal is to educate a huge percentage of the US population. You know, I think the numbers are projected to run at least 60% of the country to have college, baccalaureate degrees at, at a minimum for us to remain a competitive, thriving nation in a global economy. Uh, we're nowhere near that. So it's not going to be that institutions are going to go away, but we need to scale up. You know, the, the elites are going to continue to be there as long as they can support themselves financially. And we're going to continue to be there and we're going to continue to grow. We, have to, we all have to navigate our financial environments. Uh, but what's different about the U.S. Is, the, is this system that we have, that there are so many points of access for so many people. Yeah. It's not just the top two or three percent of the graduating high school class that gets to go to Peking University or Tsinghua University. Uh, you know, in, in China, they've got many more people they have nowhere near the institutions of the quality of the ones you see here. They just don't exist in any um, measurable way there. So you use the word trash talk. That must mean you're a journalist. Uh, because <laughs> you, because, because you, you, you synthesize from what we said somehow that there was a disparaging comment in that. There isn't a disparaging comment. We need this multiversity of institutional types. It turns out that some institutions have decided to narrow their sociological complexity by maintaining a highly successful model from the past. If all institutions follow that exact same path, the country is not successful. Right. Now that doesn't mean that one is an elite research university and one isn't. It turns out that the University of California at Berkeley was an elite research university in 1950. In 1950, it admitted students with 3.0 grade points who took 16 hard courses in, in uh, high school. So we looked recently at the admission requirements for UC Berkeley from 1868 until now and the dozens and dozens of times that they've been changed. Each time that they've been changed, they've been changed to maintain a certain sociological construct. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just that then that, if that was the case, if UC Riverside had the exact same admission requirements, which it doesn't, they take the upper four or five percent, you take the upper 12 percent, uh, we take a, a deeper uh, cross-section of the high school class than that. What we have is we have become delusionally misinformed about what is excellence. We believe that excellence is a function of who is excluded from the institution. Excellence is a function of what is produced by the institution. And some institutions take e quote-unquote elite students and they produce fantastic products. Berkeley is an example of that. Michigan is an example of that. Some institutions, these institutions represented here, have to find a way to take a broader cross-section of students and produce as close to equal or equal a product as possible. Because someone within this large, complex society has got to figure out how to do that. So it's not trash talk about those schools that maintain that model. We need that model. It's not the only model, and it's also not the pinnacle. It's not the, it's not the model that we all strive to, and that's probably half of the reason that we're screwed up in higher education is that we believe that somehow that's what we all have to aspire to be yeah. when it isn't the case. You're with science. You know there's strength in genetic diversity. We don't all need to be the same. There is strength in genetic diversity just as there is strength in the diversity of our higher education system. All right, we'll let that be the last word. I think we have to get let the audience get on to their next panel, if not their next class. Uh, would you join me in thanking this uh, excellent uh, panel of University presidents, and I think it's time for our next uh, our next session. <laughs>